Good morning. Welcome to you, the early risers of Grace Lutheran Church today, the, the few and proud who made it up an extra hour early to be in God's house today. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed with all of you. Uh, I'm not so used to, though, walking down the center aisle and having the sun glare me in the face yet, but uh, I'll, I'll get there. We're, we're at that time of the year. Uh, my name is Landon Martin. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. Privileged to be leading and serving in worship today along with uh, Pastor Yoon, Jenny, one of our elders, and Becky on the organ. Uh, one quick uh, announcement is inside your bulletin, there's a flyer about uh, the nominating committee. It's that time of year where we start to look at um, who's serving where and how we can all be a part of the uh, the community of faith that exists here at Grace. And so uh, if you've been thinking about ways to get more involved, there's uh, some helpful information there about what different boards and committees do. So uh, take note of that and, and prayerfully consider uh, how God might use some of your time and talents here in this place. Um, we're continuing this week our Lenten Wednesday services at 7 p.m. around the theme of uh, what people mean for evil, God can use for good. And so we're going to keep looking at uh, some different Holy Week-specific texts and how God uses um, some sinful activity of the people around and, and turns it ultimately into good for all of us. And so uh, I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Um, today, our theme is a really interesting one. We, uh, we find Jesus on his way toward Jerusalem for what uh, we know is going to be his, his last, his final visit there. And uh, we have a, a very peculiar run-in with uh, the Pharisees, where it seems like they are being friendly and helpful, and we're just not used to seeing that from the Pharisees. And so we are going to uh, take a, a look at that, a, a deep dive, and figure out exactly what's going on here, what the climate is, what that has to do with our, our place in this uh, repentant Lenten season, looking forward to uh, Holy Week and Easter. And uh, ultimately, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to use this gospel lesson as a means to look at our own lives and see, um, see ways that we uh, ways, ways that we need the Savior more and more all the time. And so, uh, those are some of the some of the themes you'll see coming through in our service today. And uh, with that said, it's my hope and prayer that God will bless you as you start uh, this week in his name and with his blessing with, uh, as he serves us in worship today. And I invite you to stand and begin that service with our hymn of invocation.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Please kneel or be seated for a time of confession. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Be angry and do not sin. Offer right sacrifices. There are many who say, who will show us some good? You have put more joy in my heart. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body, from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent is from Jeremiah chapter 26. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, 
this man deserves the sentence of death, because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words you have heard. Now therefore mend your ways and your deeds, and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will relent of, this, of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Philippians chapter 3 and 4. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. At, there, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 13, and I would like to ponder on with you the following words of Jesus to start. And on the third day, I will finish my course. So far the text. A Florida man in 2016 found treasure off the Florida Keys. He was apparently just diving around, and he found this huge treasure of emeralds supposedly belonging to Spanish explorers. He brought it back to land and instantly started calling news stations and attorneys and anyone that would listen to see this treasure that he had found. Now, the best part about it was he claimed he could find lots more treasure. He knew how. And so he hired a a PR firm and a publicist and some attorneys, and he started taking investments from people that he could then go lead out to find treasure all on their own. It was an incredible opportunity that looked too good to be true, and it was. At a certain point, one of the investors wanted to see some of the emeralds. He showed them some of the emeralds. They had some tests done, and they found residue on the emeralds that could only come from modern stone-cutting techniques. Apparently, this Florida man had bought these emeralds just out any old day and came up with this get-rich-quick scheme and fooled people to the tune of millions of dollars. And the irony here is this get-rich-quick scheme made him broker than ever, as he's still, uh, now that it is six years later, sorting through the lawsuits of all of it. A Nebraska man, a number of years ago, came up with an incredible idea for a company that still exists. And it uses advertisements like, do you want your friends and family to see that you have a very glamorous life, even more so than you really do? Well, what this company does is you can send them digital photographs of yourself, and they will superimpose you into destinations around the world, and they'll give them back to you with suggested descriptions of those pictures to put on your social media, and they'll give you fact sheets of the places that you visited on this vacation that you were never on, so that you can answer questions and brag about it even more when people gush about the vacation you claim to have gone on. Supposedly, this company was started on the back of a study that found that 50%, 5 0, half of Americans from 25 to 45 have lied about going on a luxurious vacation to their friends and family at some point. And this Nebraska man cashed in on that deception. Now, these are very kind of common things that we hear on the news and in society. And honestly, it's not a good mark for our society that it's so easy to find these little stories about deception all around us. And I think that's where we need to zoom into our gospel lesson, because there is a lot of deception going on right out of the gates. So as we jump into this gospel lesson, what we see is Jesus is essentially in Galilee, and he is journeying toward Jerusalem for what we know will be his last visit to Jerusalem. And along the way, before he leaves Galilee, some Pharisees come up to him, and they give him this warning. They say, Jesus, you have to leave the area as soon as possible. Herod wants to kill you. Now, at first glance, Thank you very much, Pharisees. I appreciate the warning. Like we read this and and maybe feel good for a moment that the Pharisees are helping Jesus, caring about Jesus, wanting him to get out of danger really quickly. But are they? They are the Pharisees, after all. And it just feels a little funny, doesn't it? That the Pharisees want to help Jesus. They haven't done this before. What's in it for them? I think some context is helpful here. 
As Jesus is concluding his ministry in this area of Galilee, he is super popular, like the Beatles first in America popular, incredibly popular. So he has the crowds very much on his side in most of the towns and villages. So he has a lot of support. And that means that the Pharisees don't have that support that they once enjoyed. It's very important to them that they have had this kind of life and death fear influence over most of the people all of the time. And now all of a sudden the crowds look first to Jesus and maybe second to the Pharisees. They don't like that very much. Now, add to that the fact that they wouldn't be able to really stir up much trouble for Jesus since wherever they go, the crowds are going to protect him. And in city after city, Jesus has made the Pharisees look kind of silly in these public debate settings. And on top of all of it, King Herod really was not that concerned with Jesus at this point. Not this King Herod. This King Herod really wanted to meet Jesus to see some miracles, like a circus sideshow kind of idea. So he was very intrigued by the idea of Jesus and not so much wanting to kill him. Now, it is still the King Herod that killed John the Baptist, and the basement of his house was a prison, essentially. And so there's obviously danger there. But it's really thought of historically that at this point, there's not a lot of danger for Jesus in Galilee. And so the Pharisees have to come up with a new plan. Well, if Jesus is already moving towards the direction of Jerusalem, their plan is simple. Let's just make sure he finds his way there and gets out of Galilee. See, earlier in chapter 13 of Luke, Luke tells us about this horrible tragedy where Pontius Pilate sent uh, soldiers, essentially, Roman soldiers, into the temple during worship, during the sacrifices, where they killed the priests offering the sacrifices. And it even, it even gives us the detail that the blood of the priests mixed with the sacrifices over the altar, a horrible atrocity. And it comes in a long string of these, like, blasphemous occurrences where Pontius Pilate is ruthless towards the Jewish people to try to keep control. And they hate him all the more because he's not just insulting them, he's insulting God. So... Pontius Pilate was specifically concentrating on keeping the Jewish population under control with his ruthlessness in Jerusalem. Now, we can add to that that Pontius Pilate got to choose the high priest at this point, and so the Jewish leadership was also in his pocket. And the high priest here is a dangerous enemy of Jesus, someone that doesn't even believe in the resurrection, and so all of Jesus' teachings are opposed to what he's trying to accomplish. Furthermore, the Pharisees in Jerusalem had lots more influence and authority and power. They had their own, uh, their own guards, their own soldiers, their own jail. By way of the Sanhedrin, they were far more powerful. And the cherry on top is that Jesus did not have the crowds in Jerusalem like he had in Galilee. He didn't have the overwhelming support of the people everywhere. And so the most dangerous place for Jesus in the whole world right now is Jerusalem. And so the Pharisees in Galilee come up to him and they say, you've got to get out of here. It's dangerous. You've got to head that way like you're going, just keep on going to Jerusalem because we care about you. And there we have it, the same old Pharisees. It's a new tactic, it's a new look, but it's the deception that we understand and see and experience all over all the time in our society and our world. Now, you may not be a murderous Pharisee or a Nebraska man with a deception company or a Florida man trying to sell emeralds that don't exist. But I assure you, this kind of deception is a sin that we struggle with a lot. I think a good place to start with this 
is uh, the second commandment, the meaning of the second commandment. It tells us that we should not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by God's name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. And right there, we learn a couple of things. And first of all, if you consider all the times that you have heard or said the phrase, I swear to God, probably someone's lying right there. There's not a lot of times that you need to leverage on the reputation of the Almighty when you're just simply telling the truth. That's one of the things that the Second Commandment is warning us against. And people do this all the time. All the time. So, for example, if someone were to ask you or someone else, um, how's work going? If it's not going great, you might have the urge to, you know, sugarcoat it a little bit. Maybe fudge something somewhere along the way. Or just like it, how's school going? How did that thing turn out? How you been doing lately? Any better luck with X? In all of these occasions, if things are not going great, that urge that's within us is to make it seem greater. We want to look good to our friends and family, and there is a reason why a company like the one in Nebraska can make lots of money by helping people deceive their families and friends into believing that they're more successful and have better lives than they think that they do. And so anytime that we think that our lot in life, our direction, our trajectory, our situation in any event isn't where we want it to be. That temptation is there to make it seem different than it is. Well, the meaning of the second commandment tells us that in every trouble we should call on the name of the Lord. And so the instructions of what to do when you feel like that are right there in that meaning. You should call on the name of the Lord. It should be in your prayers if you feel like you need direction or purpose or understanding of where you are. If life isn't where you want it to be, if you don't know where you're headed, take it to the Lord. And I think that's a really important thing because God has the power, the authority, the wisdom, the will to point you in a direction that he wants you to go and to forgive you for pushing him out along the way. Now, when it comes to Jesus, he is not deceived for a moment. When Jesus hears this from the Pharisees, he essentially tells them, he sends them on an errand to go call Herod a fox. Now, I think it's helpful to know that in uh, first century Israel, the Jewish people like to use fox as kind of a slang insult for someone that uh, sounds really powerful and talks really big, but isn't. Like, uh, bark is bigger than bite, we might say today, is what Jesus is saying. Go tell Herod that he's loud and weak. That's what Jesus says in return. Now, He may have wanted Jesus to perform miracles for him, but he still killed John the Baptist and has a prison in his basement. This is a very dangerous person, and it's incredibly bold of Jesus to say this. And I think any one of us, if we're confronted with a person that has life and death authority over us, I'm not sure we'd be that bold. And so what is it here that has Jesus come out of the gates strong and bold and with purpose and continuing on his course? Well, Jesus says that he needs to, on the third day, finish his course. And Jesus is not going to be deterred by any kind of warning, any kind of deception, any kind of anything until he finishes that course because the thing that's on the line is you. He loves you and eternity with you and your forgiveness and your relationship with God is on the line. 
And these Pharisees this day or any day or any potential murderous king or governor or guards or Sanhedrin, none of that is going to deter Jesus from finishing his course. Jesus goes on to say that Jerusalem is the place where the prophets go to be killed. And I think that's the point that brings everything together. The Pharisees do want Jesus to go to Jerusalem because it's dangerous and hope that he'll die. King Herod may have actually been in on this and wanted Jesus to die also, but to keep the blood off his own hands, wanted him to go to Jerusalem and meet that fate. Jesus predicts, though, that when he gets to Jerusalem... The crowds, the people are going to shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's kind of the opposite, but we can't help but when we hear that phrase, have our hearts and minds jump right into Holy Week and see Jesus riding into Jerusalem triumphantly on the donkey. The problem is the deception to come is that the fickle human beings that shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in a few short days, they're going to be shouting, crucify him. And I think if we're honest and truthful, that we're right there with those crowds. The Florida man, the Nebraska man, the Pharisees, King Herod, Pontius Pilate, and you and me, when we make our lives seem better than they are, we're all in this together, shouting, crucify him. And Jesus boldly and willingly goes forward to meet that fate. And that's where, for you, on the third day, he will finish his course. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life eternal. Amen. Please stand. We confess our Christian faith by reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Let us pray together. Lord Most High, be the dwelling place of your people for the sake of Jesus, who suffered temptation and death for us. Be our refuge, preserve us from temptation and suffering, and strengthen us in faith, Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, in the, midst, in the midst of this life, we encounter many temptations. Fix our eyes on Jesus, who bore temptation and faithfully resisted for us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, you bestow your riches on all who call upon you. Bless parents with wisdom as they teach their children your ways, that all households may confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, 
Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, govern the kingdoms of this world according to your holy and gracious will. Protect authorities from temptations. Equip them to curb what is evil and promote what is good. Bless the armed forces of our Lord, of our land, who work to bring peace and justice to all. We especially remember our military member, Rene, Scott, Dan, Kevin, Rachel, Josh, Michelle, Scott, Thomas, Jim, Tim, James, Jonathan, Paul, Chandler, Stephen, Randall, Chris, Stephen, Evan, Liz, Connor, Paul, Lada. Lord in your mercy, God of all mercy, you answer those who call upon you. Hear our prayers for all who are in need of healing, peace, and restoration. Especially, we pray for Mike, Bon, Don, Ray, Daryl, Terry, Renee, Nova, Nelson, Athene, Smithy, Kenny. Be with them in their trouble. Rescue and heal them according to your gracious will, Lord, in your mercy. We also pray for people of Ukraine who are suffering from the war, unexpected war. Let the peace govern the land of Ukraine. And we pray for all those in forced care. We also pray for Grace Church's renovation project. We pray that the renovation project may be smooth and successful. Glorify your name. Almighty God, as we approach this Lenten season with repentant heart, keep our eyes fixed on your Son, Jesus Christ, who bore our sin. Strengthen us when we are tempted and teach us to rely upon your word as our defense through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord who overcame the assault of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with a cleansed heart we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal peace in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with the angels and the archangels and with all the company of heaven, we lord and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by all availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we beg your Lord to forgive and renew, strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bid us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the end of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us to you alone, O Father. Be all glory, honor, worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on us as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us, and deliver us from evil, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. The true body and true blood of Jesus Christ, thanks and pledge of you in true faith to life everlasting, depart in peace and joy. Amen. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into, our, into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our heart and mind by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.